All right, don't thank you very much. Um, let us start by seeing some hands. Uh, who of you knows OWASP sum? Yeah, about about every everybody. Uh, who thinks that I should be saying Sam instead of some? <laughs> ah, really, Bart? You do? Yeah, you're Americans or? No. Sam's better. Yeah, it's more natural, perhaps. Okay. Well, I, I try to think of that, but. <laughs> uh, in this talk, I'd like to discuss the work that we've done to extend SUM, which is, as you know, a framework of activities uh, with which you can set up secure software development and grow from there, to make it work for Agile. And um, let me start by introducing myself. So I'm Rob van der Veer. I lead the security and privacy practice at Software Improvement Group, SIG, the ones on the lanyards and in the uh, expo space. We are uh, concurring, re recurring uh, sponsors of this event. And for a large part of my career, I've been building software. I've been a, a software entrepreneur, and I made a lot of mistakes, and I learned a lot of things, and now I'm dispensing the things that I learned as a consultant for Software Improvement Group. What we do is we measure software quality, we advise on software quality, we have a laboratory for it, we have consultants for this, we make software quality, including security and privacy, we make it visible and help clients to get software right. Um, we also like to share our knowledge, we do a lot of research, a lot of collaborations, a lot of involvement in standards, for example, for the European Commission, we're now working on how the European Commission and ANISA can build cyber security certification schemes and how they can help harmonize existing standards. Quite a challenge. Um, working with IEEE on privacy, working with the Dutch CIP, also on security by design and privacy. And we're working with uh, some, which brings me nicely to the topic of this talk. Uh, here on the picture, you see our headquarters. It's uh, in Amsterdam. It's, it's almost a stone's throw away, if you're a really good thrower, by the way. Um, so a long time ago, when I started doing talks on software engineering, I, I would be using a diagram like this, you know, with the requirements and the design and the development, and I would discuss these individual activities. But there's a problem there, because at some point in time, I was getting this, angry people, because apparently that's not agile, right? And I wanted to explain that, yeah, but even in Agile, you have some form of these activities, and talking about these activities is still relevant, right? But just to avoid that silly argument, I did I did this. I added this circle, and I got rid of that. So, cool. But it was not a problem. This was totally not DevOps. And this was not just people saying, you should change that visual. It was people saying, everything you were saying about software engineering does not apply, and it's a blatant lie, and it's it's totally incorrect, right? It was really emotional, if you will. Um, so I started to visualize software engineering as what it mostly basically is. It's a mix of activities that are not in phases, but sometimes they are, right? But let's let's just forget that nuance. And I... I'll show it like this. But of course, it turns out that Waterfall is not dead. And I get, I think I'm listening to my audience uh, too much, perhaps. Uh, so I decided to stick with this, because if I would go further, I would um, be using this, the politically correct secure software development life cycle. And it's not what we want. We want to keep it simple, and we want to use a structure with which we describe activities. But because we have this structure, it doesn't mean that every activity should be a separate phase, right? And the same goes for some. Sam, sorry. So Sam is Sam is a flagship uh, OWASP project. It describes activities according to business functions. It describes maturity, very important. So you can start real easy with every activity and then build from that. Now, the thing with some, Sam, sorry, I'm going to do that a hundred times, but it's a good way to practice it. Um, it's, it's a process agnostic, right? So it doesn't describe um, how you apply it in Agile or in Kanban or in Waterfall because it wants to provide a generic model and talk about the activities. 
Um, so what you would get is, of course, angry people saying this is not agile. And they have a valid point because it turns out to be not really easy to find out how you make agile successful, uh, how you make security successful in, in, in an agile uh, environment. Um, because what is the challenge here? The challenge is that all these activities you need to squeeze into a sprint because at the end of the sprint, you want to have had security built in and you want to ideally be able to release the software. And this is, this is where the challenge is. Um, so a brief one on one on agile. I'm taking, uh, the popular scrum method as an example here. Um, you're doing sprints, so you're doing iterative release and building of software in three weeks, two weeks, one month, typically with a team of typically eight to 10 people of builders and testers. Um, you're preparing your work in a backlog. You're planning your work to be done in a sprint, resulting in a sprint backlog. So you're planning and preparing security and you're implementing security during the sprint leading to a shippable product. And also you have daily scrums and you have stories and you have definitions of done. You have acceptance criteria, all these, these typical uh, agile scrum elements, uh, and, uh, process elements and, and, and artifacts, if you will. You want to know what to do with those if you want to build security in. And what you can do is then you look it up. So you can Google, but you get a lot of varying, uh, uh, best practices on how you make it happen. A lot of experts really differ in opinion how you make it happen. And this is, uh, I think, by far the, the most comprehensive book on agile software security. And it says, I quote, tracking and dealing with non-functional requirements like security and reliability is an unsolved problem in agile development. This is, I think, quite, quite shocking, but also quite honest, right? This book didn't decide, so this is the way that you should do it. But it's, it uh, just listed all the different uh, opinions on how to do it, including best practices and including pitfalls. Also, what we've done. Um, just to illustrate the problems in practice, I took out some customer quotes, some real customer quotes of clients of ours uh, about uh, agile security. First, uh, this is a typical one. We need to show nice features every demo. So there's no priority for security. In a typical agile situation, in Scrum, for example, you have the process element of doing a sprint demo. So the idea is that you show the, the functions to the business and just to show, you know, we've done this and, and are you happy and get, get the feedback. The tendency is to focus that very much on the features and that the non-functionals, so things like security and reliability, are not mentioned. And the best practice is just to involve them in your story, to explain to the business what you've done to make the system secure so that they realize, ah, this is quite good. And you, in, a, in a, such a demo session, you can make it really uh, something alive, like using some examples of incidents that, that uh, have happened to be really clear about how important security is. We do security in separate sprints because we cannot fit security in every sprint. And this is something that I understand why it um, uh, it comes into existence. But the problem is you can do this for some verification, focus that in certain sprints, but you cannot skip building in security onto some other sprint because you'll be doing a lot of rework. You need to find a way to include building in security in every sprint. We have a wiki with 400 rules and we'll see results at the next pen test in six months. This, this happens a lot. So people do a lot of good work to, you know, to collect all the coding guidelines and all the uh, ACS and all the mobile ACS, et cetera, et cetera, rules. And somehow they need to transfer it to the teams. And one way to do this is to put it on a wiki. Another way to do this is to do the training. But in the end, People cannot remember and totally apply all the time these, these 400 rules. It just doesn't work. So you have to find another way. And there's a good way. And I have, uh, an example of, of how you can make it happen in Agile. Uh, and also this pen test, uh, in six months is way too long a feedback cycle. Of course, you want to have feedback almost every sprint. Then this one, rerun this tool every sprint and voila, we are secure. So this is based on the idea that you, 
you have to automate your verification. You have to automate your testing. And that's a very good practice to strive for. But you also have to realize that some of the issues in software, you just cannot detect using tools. You just cannot. You have to do manual reviews of your design, of your code. You have to do uh, yeah, things that only experts can do. So you have to find a way to make them really fast. And I'll have more on that uh, later. And finally, we've made John responsible for security, so now it's no longer my problem. So you probably recognize this. Uh, this is, well, this practice is based on the idea of appointing someone who has a certain responsibility in a team regarding security. And that's fine as long as everybody else feels the responsibility as well. The responsibility for this champion person is ideally the role of a liaison. So somebody who takes and the responsibility of bringing people together and sharing knowledge. But it's not the person that needs to take care of security, and it's not the person that uh, will be responsible at the moment that there's uh, there's some security incident. So that's also a demonstration of uh, what a pitfall is, and we've collected a lot of these pitfalls in the uh, Agile notes. Which brings me to the Agile notes, the SAM Agile notes. Um it's work that we've done in collecting uh, best practices and pitfalls from practice and from literature. So I see a lot of development teams and my colleagues see a lot of development teams. My peers in the industry see a lot. I work with a number of them, did interviews, did observations. And notably, I work with Michael, who's sitting right here, who works for Centric, who's involved at Centric, and he is implementing Security is making sure that it happens there in the many development teams uh, that they have there. So it's very useful input from you, Michael. Um, I work with uh, the SAM work group and I work with a work group from the CIP. And this is how this got initiated. Initiated. It's a bit of a side story, but I think it's, it's an important one. Um, it's April 2018. And I'm part of a working group at CIP, which is a Dutch organization that creates, um, pragmatic guidelines and standards, if you will, to aid mainly government organizations in, in security. And our assignment was to write uh, guidance on agile software security. And some work already had been done, and I looked at it, and it was, well, mainly describing the things that have been described so many times, especially by, by Sam. And I... I managed to convince them that this was not a good idea and it, it was better to refer to Sam and then work on the agile notes, work on the things that are particularly agile and add those to Sam, not integrate it into Sam, but provide it as notes that you can put at the different topics whenever they're relevant. So it's easy to create a publication that contains the Sam activities and the agile uh, uh, notes together with them, but also you can do other horizontal versions of SAM by creating a version of SAM that has the SAM activities and then, for example, Kanban or DevOps editions. So you can make a process specific versions of SAM using this approach. Um, and here you see a sort, sort of a zoomed out view of uh, how the Agile notes currently are. If you look at the notes, um, there are some main principles behind it. There's no time, of course, to go through uh, all of them. I'll have one or two uh, examples in this in this talk. But it mainly is about the co couple principles. And the first one is uh, continuous collaboration between dev, between test, ops, security, and collective ownership. The collaboration is essential because there is no time in a sprint to create software and then send it over to the security department to test it, right? You need some collaboration, continuous collaboration, and the security team becomes, if they were not already uh, working that way, much more in a enabling and supporting uh, role. Collective ownership is the same. Ownership should be with security teams, should be with the developers, but also with the product owner who should see really security as a business value. Of course, 
automating verification, automating your tests using all kinds of tools, the DOS tools, SOS tools, uh, your own integration tests, your own security unit tests, uh, as much as possible. And the work that remains, the key is to make that incremental. So work like um, threat modeling, work like uh, code review, work like pen testing. Look closely at the changes that have been made. And for code review, this is relatively easy because you need to look at the deltas, right? But for pen testing, you need to think more about what behavior the system could have changed, and then we'll focus our tests uh, on that. And of course, you want to, uh, if you do this repeatedly, uh, make this to see if you can automate it as well. Um, and then a very important one is to minimize the repeated work by experts. I'm not saying you have to ditch your security experts. No, the key is to make sure that you're not relying on their expertise constantly because their expertise is is scarce, right? You, you probably know the stories of one security professional for every 50 uh, developers. You don't, do not want these guys and girls to, to burn out. And of, co of course, uh, expert work takes time. You cannot analyze every change that you want to make on your system. You want to have some process that's faster than that. And of course, experts, even if they're experts, they can also make mistakes. So the key is to minimize repeated expert work. And you can do this, for example, by deferring security as much as possible to the frameworks that you're using, the libraries that you're using, so that a large part of the security requirements are satisfied by the technology that you base your work on. Um, and to build uh, prepared tests, so to build some of the expertise in ready-made tests that you can apply in a sprint whenever it's necessary to do a certain check and you don't have to invent that uh, at the moment that you need to apply it. The same goes for instructions and this is quite important. Um, in order for developers to not require a constant babysitting by security professionals, it's important to make instructions that they can apply and, and that's the last bullet, as situational as possible. So depending on the type of work that they're doing, they should be getting in ready-made instructions that really help them uh, with getting that job done. For example, they're building a, a login form uh, on a website and based on the type of functions that they're realizing at that point, they are getting ready-made tests and ready-made instructions that are just for that task, which prevents a situation that they have to deal with hundreds of requirements and figure out themselves which one of these requirements are applicable to what they're building. So this is to minimize the, the cognitive load because it's undoable for developers to have continuously these rules available when they're all generic. Um, I'm calling this situational approach preferring hardening and hygiene over analysis. Let me go into that. So the hygiene approach is based on if you're going to uh, eat dinner, you first wash your hands. So if you're going to build a login form, there's a couple of rules that you need to follow. You want to have all these, let's call them trivial parts of your work prepared. And in this case, there's an example where there's a trigger, right? There's a, a, a sort of criterion for the type of work that you're doing. You're doing authentication at some point in time. There's a uh, login form, and there's a couple of requirements and tests that are prepared. And in this case, um, I lifted out one example that is about login forms that have a reset, reset password function. What you want with this function is that you don't want that people can uh, learn that somebody has an account on a website, because there can be private information, like, for example, uh, some, some mental clinic, um, you know, can be really private information that a certain person, a certain email address, is registered with a certain web service. And resetting passwords sometimes is a way to find out if somebody is a member. And one clever way is to do a, a sort of a timing to time how much time it takes when you enter an email address. And sometimes in some websites that we've encountered, it takes longer for somebody to reset the password if they're already uh, 
a member of the website. The key, the requirement here is think of making this just take just as much time when somebody is known or not known. Um, this is something that you have to come up with if you do not rely on these ready-made requirements and these triggers, because then you'll be building something and you have to analyze. So you have to sit together, take the whiteboard, have the security professional there. So in the typical threat modeling approaches, what are we doing? We're building a login forum. What can go wrong? And then you use your experience uh, to really come with a list of things that can go wrong. And there are good methods for this that help you, but it's hard for everybody to be really sharp and have all the things available that, that are required at a certain point. So I'm not saying that threat modeling, because that's what this is, uh, is useless. It's very useful, especially on a high level, uh, uh, design issue. But for trivial things, things that, that, you know, are, are well known when it's software engineering, you want to have a hygiene approach because it's much quicker and it's also much more complete. Make sense? Okay, let's take out an example. Requirements flow. Very important requirements are basically the things that you want to um, have an effect on the way you work. You could see software, secure software engineering as applying countermeasures against uh, uh, attacks and these countermeasures need to be there and the countermeasures, countermeasures are basically the requirements. So it starts with the requirements and the idea is that before you start building a system, you prepare uh, the set of requirements. So typically as an organization, if you have a certain maturity, you already have a baseline, you have a collection of things that you need to comply with that you regard as important in software engineering. So the way you prepare this is, is, uh, is this. Part of those requirements are not applicable to developers. So you rule those out. You have to do something with them, of course, but you shouldn't bother developers with them. Also, uh, part of these requirements are not applicable for a system because of the way it's being applied, because of the context. You can do some risk analysis there, um, and you can then, for example, accept a number of risks, which which is a way to drop a set of requirements. But of course, you need to record this, right? You need to record the risk that you are accepting. Uh, hopefully, a large part of the requirements can be taken care of by your framework, by you know, the technology that you're using. And then there's a set of what we call story-specific requirements. These are requirements that depend on the type of work that you're doing, like building a login forum or... Um, realizing uh, a session uh, mechanism. There are rules if you're building specific trivial functions like that. And we call those rules, we call those triggers. So let's see if this works. Yes. So here you see uh, the triggers. So the types of things that you're building and then the requirements that you need for that specific type of work which takes care of, you know, reducing the cognitive load of the developers. So if you're doing work X at that moment, you need to just take into account these four things. But there are always, and this is the last category, uh, requirements that you need to take into account all the time. And what do you do with these yellow and red requirements? You need to turn them into something that works. And those are instructions and tests. So for the framework rule, the requirement is just use the framework. Look at the framework if you want to build something. If it's already there, use the framework. Otherwise, you build it yourself. But there's also one test involved, which is test where the developers really are using the framework. And this requires some work. And the typical way to verify this is do, do peer review. So this should be on the checklist of doing peer reviews. It's quite a simple test, but it's, it's important. We see a lot of teams that could have used really beautiful functions that are already in the framework that they didn't know about. Uh, next are the story-specific requirements. These are instructions and tests that are in what we call a pick list. So I'll show later that this pick list you use when you are um, refining a story to add the necessary instructions and tests to that story. The tests, they become part of the acceptance criteria of a story and instructions are communicated to the developers. 
I'm saying instructions because um, the requirement itself can be a way to communicate to developers what needs to be done, but it mostly is um, it's almost like a legal document, right? It's it's for both. You can do um, you can create much uh, nicer instructions for developers from these requirements. If you haven't done that yet, you can of course to communicate the requirements and the original requirements in themselves to the developers. But the recommendation in the Sam Agile notes is to make these into developer instructions. Also because uh, sometimes you just can leave out a requirement as an instruction because you believe that developers already know this. For example, if there are a couple of deprecated functions that you shouldn't be using and you just assume that most developers uh, know this, and you have a nice test that checks if people are using this with a short uh, life si uh, feedback cycle, it is fine to just do not have any instructions at all on this. Just mention it once in the training and have a simple test. And this is an example of, of a system generic uh, uh, test that doesn't have an instruction. So from this preparation phase that you do before you start building a system, um, I have to say that this is, in an agile situation, of course, uh, based on the initial idea of a system, which typically should evolve. So you also should revisit this preparation, this list of requirements, to see if it's still up to date with the current posture uh, and then the, the context uh, of the system. What comes out of it is... Uh, something that's referred, referred from the definition of done. So a set of generic requirements with uh, instructions and tests. A uh, pick list, you know, the requirements that you select per story. And uh, perhaps a thread model that you have drawn in your initial session thinking about uh, on a very high uh, architectural level about your system. Then per story... You start from the pick list, adding relevant requirements to the story acceptance criteria. And this is, that brings me to one of the pitfalls. Um, when you Google about how you should do uh, agile uh, security, you'll find some recommendations that you should uh, do this in sprint planning meetings. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to a planning meeting. It's always a really busy meeting. You have to get the planning out. It's it's stressful. It's boring. And there's simply no time to, to in this whole plenary group, to discuss all the security elements. So the best practice is to do this during refinements and during creation of the story. So you're thinking of, okay, so we need to build a login form. Let's immediately have a look at the pick list. At that no time, we should have lunch. Okay, then we'll refine this story later. We'll create it, but we need to have added these instructions and requirements before we go into sprint planning. Because then, during sprint planning, you can take into account that this will take you work, right? It will take you work to make sure that resetting the password actually takes as much time for for every known uh, every known user and unknown users. So the result is a user story with acceptance criteria. And you use that in your process. So refinement, I mentioned. Planning, I mentioned. Um, of course, and the sprint review is important because then you can, uh, of course, uh, assess how successful you were with applying security, how successful you were with, with planning these security elements. And as I mentioned, the uh, sprint demo, uh, because that allows you to also to demonstrate to the business the value of the effort that you put into building security in. Uh, talking about demo, just uh, thought of this tomorrow at 10.15, um, the real uh, Sebastien is going to demonstrate uh, some in a session. So if you're interested, uh, please join that. Uh, oh yeah, I, f I forgot the, uh, the nice uh, circle. And this is to illustrate uh, some other elements that are in the uh, Agile notes, for example, transparency and measurements. If you want to improve your security, you should be measuring uh, the maturity of your process, but you also should have some metrics that show to stakeholders, to the 
team, but also to other teams because that can ignite a gaming effect. How you are dealing with security issues, how you are resolving them, what's coming out of the security test and how mature uh, a team is. And I'm saying this because one of the best practices in our notes is that teams should be uh, autonomous, right? They for themselves can grow. Of course, you can facilitate exchanging uh, lessons learned and pitfalls and, and, and experiences between teams. But teams for themselves should figure out uh, where they are and how they can improve based on the type of, you know, the part of the system that they're working on, the people in in the, in the group and the experience that they have. Which brings me to some links. Uh, the Agile notes have been uh, published. Uh, Nicely automatic by the beautiful uh, system that uh, looks at GitHub and just push, pushes it nicely to uh, to the website. The idea is in is in the, the next version to have it integrated into versions of SAM by showing these as as extra notes in uh, in publications. Of course, the OSM uh, website and my email address because I would really welcome your feedback. Right, your own experiences. So even if you're mad at me, if you want to boo, just please do it uh, right after this talk at the SNG booth or in email. At the first version of the Agile notes are probably things that we've overlooked, perhaps some things that we got wrong. Just prove us wrong and we can improve these Agile notes. I would welcome that very much. And on a personal note, um, this is a security conference. So I focused on security. But the thing is that these activities, like thinking about what can go wrong, what you need to uh, apply uh, situationally, measuring all these aspects, do not count for just security. It's also something that counts for uh, data protection, right? Privacy. It's also something that counts for reliability, for maintainability. So my recommendation would be to see if you can make your security program a software quality program. Now, it's the same mechanisms. It's also... Uh, awareness, it's showing the business values of things, and it would be a waste if you would need to have a separate program for every single quality in the development environment. Thank you for that. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, 10 minutes of questions, if you will, and otherwise a break. Thank you very much. On uh, the slide with the zoomed out pages, you had one page, I think, on uh, taken out of the grip op SSD method from CIP. Mm -hmm. Is there overlap or do they complement this uh, OWASP sum? Yeah, uh, <laughs> funny that you recognize that. Um, the picture looks the same because um, I also made the uh, picture in the grip op SSD. Uh, as I was involved from the very beginning. For those of you who don't know this, this is uh, a, a guideline uh, also written by the CIP that I mentioned earlier, the Dutch organization, and it describes how you can be clear from a client towards a software maker in uh, what you think is secure to set right requirements and also to have a dialogue on this. It's based, it's based on comply or explain. It's based on, it describes how you interact and measure quality. And part of this is uh, a set of basic requirements. That's a separate uh, document. And the funny thing is that uh, these requirements, they don't have triggers yet. So what we're doing right now is we are, are extending these requirements and making them applicable depending on the situation and really enabling applying these agile nodes using these uh, these standards on hip uh, hop day so that's the relation right there anybody else bart all right guys see you around yeah. oh. Oh. Oh.